three more minutes and we'll get started. And I think this session goes until 45, 12.45 and then lunch? Uh, 12.50. 12 12 okay. 50. Great. And is lunch on site or is it off site? It's on site. Fine. Great. Same area as we had the uh, breakfast at? I'll make that announcement so we're all on the same page for grab. <laughs> Hey guys. Hey. <laughs> Playing a little of your uh, your music for the uh, session opening. It's the XX. Not not you. Oh, sorry. Your country's music. Uh, I wish I had some of your music. Do you, do you uh, just have what you have on YouTube, I suppose, or SoundCloud? Or? Okay. YouTube is really cool. Okay. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Listener by any chance? Have you heard of Listener by any chance? It's a, it's a spoken verse project out of the U.S. It's probably pretty niche. Okay. He's here right. He's actually touring in Europe right now, and I, I wanted to go like see him while he was here. But it's 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 not electronic music. It's mostly just rock but with spoken verse. So. Okay. Okay. <laughs> My latest find. My latest. And I, I really like. There's a kind of like a synthwave revival right now that I really, really like. Um, did you see uh, Tron? Or not Tron. Um, Thor. The new Thor movie. No, but their soundtrack is. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically like a mixture of synthwave and Led Zeppelin. That was the. <laughs> Start a minute early, I suppose. No harm in that. This will give me time to make sure I don't have any technical difficulties. All right, I think this should be broadcasting now. <laughs> um, and Andy, do we have to do anything to record? Should I be recording my screen, or is it all? Uh, it should automatically just come in, but as I do it, right. it just happens in the background. All right. Well. One, one day we. Maybe they'll see me messing with Facebook on the uh, video then. <laughs> I trust they'll crop it accordingly. <laughs> All right, welcome. How do we feel about recycling these cups? Are these recyclable? Or do they have wax? Do you know? Any money? No. I'll, I'll save them just in case. Okay, I just didn't know, because sometimes they have like wax on the inside and they don't... Well, uh, I'll let them sort it out. <laughs> All right, welcome class. Um, you're in uh, <laughs> Drupal Commerce 202, uh, Reporting and Analytics in Commerce 2.x. Um, I think we'll skip personal introductions since I just had the pleasure of doing a personal introduction for everybody. That was probably way more personal than you were expecting. <laughs> um, and we'll cut right to the chase about, you know, uh, the topic again, Reporting and Analytics in Commerce 2.x. And just um, maybe before I even go that direction, Drupal Commerce is a known thing. You wouldn't be here. Has anyone actually used Commerce 2 yet for Drupal 8? I know some people have begun. Uh, in production or just use it? Uh, you, you know, you're, you're doing stock work. Yeah, that counts. So I know that we have, um, we've always had, honestly, good contributors and end users in the UK and in Europe in general. I mean, Guy is a long time contributor to the project for the stock module, and uh, I know other people in here have contributed patches and, and, um, uh, just helps us make it better, so much obliged. <laughs> uh, but Drupal Commerce reached a full 2.0 release um, at uh, DrupalCon last year at Vienna. Sorry, I kind of get my, all of our releases are around different Drupal events. So our first beta was at Dublin, and then our, our 2.0 full release was in Vienna. And we have since then had a point release every month. So we have you know 2.1 in November, 2.2 in December, and so on. And we're really trying to, to follow Drupal Core's lead in creating regular updates of the core module set. Um, but then also we're trying to maintain um, a, like a roadmap for uh, filling the gaps in our contributed module ecosystem. Um, so you, you may have noticed on uh, the Drupal Commerce slide I used this morning um, that, that we talk about Drupal Commerce as an ecosystem where you do have a core framework 
But then there's all these other contributed modules, many of which we consider to be essential systems to the Drupal Commerce project that just aren't in the actual like core code base. So that would be things like shipping, um, which was financed last year by ADAPT, um, a Drupal agency in Denmark, I believe, that they, they sponsored porting that to Drupal Commerce 2, and then of course a whole sub-ecosystem will develop around the shipping and fulfillment modules. Um, next, uh, we worked with Torchbox here in the UK, who funded a lot of work in the commerce recurring space um, to support uh, re recurring billing, digital subscription management, that kind of stuff. And then now we've kind of turned our sights toward reporting and analytics, because these are things that obviously are essential to doing business online. Um, a lot of this work is funded by ourselves. There's also an agency in uh, the U.S. called Impactive that's sponsoring some of this work. We have community contributors from companies like uh, Acromedia, individual contributors like Steve Oliver, Chris Rockwell, and others. And so what I'm presenting today is kind of like the lay of the land for what you can do to add reporting and analytics to a Drupal Commerce site today, and then a little bit of like where it's going. Um, so, and then we'll, we'll pause for questions at the very end. Uh, and then, even more importantly, lunch is right after this at 12.50, back in the same area as breakfast. Um, so the, there's a, a fundamental question that we kind of probably can all spitball answers to, which is, why is reporting important? And um, I think that, that any one of you could probably answer this question, right? Like, merchants want to know what products you're selling. Um, they want to know who they're selling to. So if you have a top-selling customer, how do I identify them and then send them special offers, or maybe not send them special offers because they buy from me anyways? Um, you can do some fun stuff like that, like send a coupon to anybody who only ever buys with a coupon, but don't send a coupon to the customers who always buy without a coupon, because then you're just giving away a margin. Um, so you can do stuff like that when you're doing good reporting. You can also find out what is the actual ROI on my marketing campaigns. Is it better for me to spend my time building up Twitter as a channel versus Facebook versus LinkedIn, or just versus direct newsletter marketing, which we actually find to be the most effective for us? And I remember, I think once upon a time, CTI had a whole case study and, and, and uh, presentation they would give around how um, you know, direct newsletter campaigns were so much more effective than their AdWords and PPC campaigns. And so you know, the only way that you could derive those insights is by doing good reporting, having good analytics. Um, and then, of course, uh, merchants have a need, even if they haven't identified it yet, to make data-driven decisions. Otherwise, they just spend money on what people tell them to spend money on. And uh, nobody likes being in that position where they're wasting their money. <laughs> Me, uh, you know, I'm sure all of us in our businesses are the same way. Um, so the way that we, we talk about um, reporting analytics is really kind of uh, just going from like raw intelligence, right? Like how do I just get raw numbers? How do I know how well my store is performing? And then once I have that like just raw data, how do I turn that into insights that help me better manage my business? Um, so how do I uh, correlate my, my traffic by channel to my conversion rates and filter my conversion funnel so that I can see the actual um, uh, success rate of one type of traffic versus another, or one type of marketing campaign versus another. And, and I also kind of take it one step further, but we're not there yet, so it's not in this presentation, to predictive analytics, right? So it's not just about gathering intelligence and then gleaning insights from them, but it's actually about like changing the way that my site works based on what I predict you're going to do on my site. And that's, that's the future. Um, you know, we're, we're, we're trying to get toward a point where we can actually score your likelihood to bounce when you come to a Drupal Commerce site. So that if I know that guy is not going to convert if he doesn't, you know, click the add to cart button in the next 33 seconds, maybe I can send him a little nudge, you know, a coupon or, uh, you know, a, a music ball dropping out of the corner and disco lights going over. It's your lucky day! Um, but, you know, predictive analytics aren't really there yet, but we'll, we'll get there and kind of like, the, the, the phases that we develop this in are just the Commerce Reports module, which is um, you know, the actual Drupal project for adding reporting capabilities to the Drupal Commerce site itself. And then, of course, we use third-party tools. I'm using Google Analytics as just an example for a generalized third-party platform for doing website analytics. And then Lean Commerce Reports, which is a tool that Commerce Guys is developing um, to kind of give us the best of both worlds and then try to get into the predictive analytics market. Um, so starting from the top and working our way to the bottom, let's just kind of address the status of commerce reports for Drupal 8. Um, if you aren't familiar with commerce reports, um, on Drupal 7, this was like the only real tool that existed for building your sales reports for your Drupal commerce site. And it's purely views based. So whenever you install a module, it's just looking at your raw data, your, your structured, normalized data in your Drupal uh, database, and creating both a dashboard and individual sales reports and 
segmentable sales reports by, by SKU or by customer ID or whatever. And um, it's, it's heavy, right? Because it's querying actual structured data. Um, this module depends on your Drupal site not going down, and your Drupal site depends on this module not taking it down. Um, and, and I found even within like Drupal 7, that, that approach to just using the normalized data. And when I say normalized, I mean like every entity's data is still in its own table. All of your field data is in its own table, and you're creating these huge you know, database queries that join all of these tables together to produce the results. Yeah, that's, that's normalization. You know, a denormalized data set is just one table that flattens it all out. Um, so this, this module historically used the first approach. And it was slow, and it also was kind of buggy. Even I, I used to sell cheese online um, from an Amish farmer using Drupal Commerce 1.x. Um, so he couldn't use the internet himself, but he could pay me to. And so we um, had a cheese store for him. And even like his low volume, the Commerce Reports module, like we often have issues just with the filters not working properly or statuses not being identifiable or whatever. And so we've, we've changed the approach for Drupal Commerce 2.x to actually make it more of a uh, a denormalization tool. Um, so we're, we're still like really early alphas for it. Um, but what happens is we define different types of uh, like report data sets that you want to collect and we denormalize data like at the time the transaction is completed into these tables. So that, that, that should make you know basic sense, right? We have a completed transactions table and a purchased products table. Whenever an order is complete, you just react to that event and you populate these tables with that um, uh, you know, denormalized data so that you then end up with just one database table that you can query to build any of your on-site reports that you want to have. Um, so, uh, you know, the advantages of using Commerce Reports, of course, are that it's free, you're not having to integrate a third-party tool, it's obviously, oh, well, it's, it's easier to make GDPR compliant because you're going to have the data and know how to delete it, whereas I couldn't tell you how to go delete data out of Google Analytics if somebody, you know, wanted to, to take themselves out of your system. Um, so there's some definite advantages to using these on-site reporting tools, but of course the disadvantages still remain. You're still adding records to your local database every time um, somebody completes a, a transaction, and then when you go to build that dashboard as a merchant, if I go view the reports page, um, you know this database table is being hit, right, and the query is being run, and the views is having to render this, and Drupal's render API is slow, and like you just run the risk in a high volume time of somebody hitting your reports page and the, the front end suffering as a result. Um, but it's, it's kind of like the best that we can do in core because we, you know, we can't really uh, like write a Drupal module that depends on people setting up a Mongo database or any other kind of NoSQL storage or document storage. Um, so we kind of you know, have a whole denormalized set of tables that we feed data into and then let you structure just with like the simple query API within Drupal itself. So you, you know, you're just doing aggregations of data in that, that single database table to, you know, create your reports. And it's, it's nice, too, because if, you know, you detect that an order is canceled or deleted, you actually can. You do have the, the primary keys here to go in and delete the data out. So you can kind of keep these up to date. And, and you actually can do real business reporting from this if you need to or want to. Um, and, and that's, of course, you know, the advantage of working with the raw order data and, uh, and then kind of transforming it however you need to. So you have the ability within the module to create new tables, to define new reports schemas, so that maybe you have your completed transactions table and you have your purchased products table, and in the US it might have like a sales tax table where I correlate an order ID and the line item ID to an amount of tax collected that I'm now owed, or that I owe to the state or the federal government or whatever. Um, so um, that's what you use commerce reports for. Um, it's going to be you know, more accurate than using a third-party tool because you're dealing with the actual raw data. Um, you're able to integrate it into views so you can mix and match the reports however you need them to be. Um, you, know, you can make them click sortable, filterable, whatever, um, with that views integration. Um, but again, the drawbacks are that you actually have to know how the views UI works in order to use it. And the average merchant won't know how to do that. You won't be able to just install the commerce reports module into Drupal Commerce and hand it off to a merchant and say, cool, go build the business reports that you need. You'll still be holding their hand through the process. Um, and then it also has like this distinct disadvantage. If you're trying to do more than just business reporting, if you're actually trying to do analytics and correlate your business performance to user traffic, um, you know, you, you we're not collecting that kind of data. We aren't collecting click path data or inbound refer URIs or query parameters from your UTM, you know, campaign parameters or whatever. Um, so it's, it's limited, um, but it's, it's a great start. So that's, that's kind of 
the status of commerce reports in the direction it's headed. Um, we're getting away from using the fully denormalized data within the Drupal database by creating these custom tables that store the, the denormalized transaction data that then is essential to building reports. You can build the reports using a query API directly or through views integration if you're a views wizard and can make that all work. Um, and that's, like I said, it's in alpha status. Um, Matt Glomman, who's also the Drupal Commerce 2.x maintainer, is maintaining this module and we expect to see continued releases over the course of this year. Um, are there any questions before I move on from this topic? Yeah. Um, so when you update, if, if you do update an order, do you update the uh, Red House information? Let's say an order is cancelled or someone has it using the yeah. end after it's completed. Yeah, so the question is what happens then if an order is cancelled or a line item is deleted after it's already been uh, denormalized into the report data set? And, and I'm not sure that um, the reports module itself would do that. Well, we'll kind of have to tease that out a little bit because um, every site may have like a bit of a different workflow for what they want to happen on a cancellation versus a deletion versus a refund or whatever. Um, and I, I even have that the question myself, which is like, if I'm trying to build an accurate sales report, I actually may want to res preserve that on this date I took in this much money, but then have a separate bucket maybe for refunded or canceled transactions. Mm -hmm. So I can see in March I took in $300,000, but then I had to refund $75,000 or something. Those are actually two separate statistics that can be individually meaningful. Um, so yeah, good question and probably one month to tease out. Um, but I actually think I like, you know, since we're doing this on the fly, I actually think I like the idea of adding a cancellations um, data set to the core model. <coughs> I think people have different, yeah, different um, ways of dealing with it financially. Yeah. yeah. Any other questions about just commerce reports in general, or shall we continue? All right. Um, so commerce reports is going to be like the, the quickest, best way for you to have access to your raw data, to gather this intelligence about how your store is performing. And the default reports that it's going to give you out of the box will also be like sufficient to assess the health of a store. So as, as a merchant, you can quickly see, okay, what are my sales, which is a good number to, to have in mind if you're running a business. Um, but obviously, we all want more. Um, out of our reporting and analytics tools. And that's where we tend to turn to um, Google Analytics as like a default third party, you know, sassy kind of analytics platform. But there are others like it, obviously. Um, HubSpot, I think, you know, can similarly help you track traffic and click paths and all that kind of stuff, user engagements. Any kind of marketing automation tool can do the same. But what, what, what tools do you use in the UK instead of Google Analytics? Or is this kind of the main thing here? What's that? Yeah, okay. I just didn't know, you know, that there, there's a whole privacy difference in privacy concerns in the U.S. versus Europe. But, um, you know, this is, you know, for us, the, the first one we always integrate um, is uh, with the Commerce Google Analytics module, adding e-commerce reporting to, like, the, the checkout completion page. And I think they have an API as well. You can, you can feed data in asynchronously via an API, which is important if you're using, like, a a payment gateway that never actually sends you to the checkout completion page. It just, you know, finalizes that PayPal or, or wherever. Um, so this module basically just uh, will, will correlate for Google the session ID of the person browsing the website with uh, the actual final transaction. And then, you know, you obviously have the ability to go into Google Analytics and create e-commerce specific reports. Um, so you can then track the, like, uh, the, the financial value of a landing page or of a campaign, an AdWords campaign or whatever. And it's actually, you know, it's pretty solid, you know. If, if what you want to do is correlate, um, you know, your, your, your revenue to web traffic, like this is probably like the fastest, cheapest way to get started. Um, and so we're actually seeking maintenance. A former employee of Commerce Guys um, kind of has the maintenance right now, but he's, he's not with us anymore. Uh, he's, he's still with us. He's just not working with us. Uh, so hopefully we'll, we'll get access to, to begin maintaining that ourselves. And the nice thing, of course, again, is that it's free. <coughs> you are giving your data to Google, um, which you know, could become more meaningful over here very soon. Um, but it's also happening client-side, which allows you to collect different kinds of user behavior. It's not just the transaction. It's, it's what they click on. It's how they came to your site. Um, it's, it's what they've done once they've gotten on your site. So you can actually track the whole conversion funnel from somebody coming in from a particular search term all the way through checkout completion. And, and then you can begin to glean that insight that lets you optimize 
um, you know, the, the types of campaigns uh, that you're running. Um, so, you know, when, once you've, you know, installed the Google, Commerce Google Analytics module, you have a little bit of configuration you have to do within your Google Analytics account um, to enable e-commerce reporting, uh, and then dig into your, your cart and check out behavior analysis. Uh, but at the end of the day, like, you, you end up with the ability to say, okay, like, show me my conversion rates for different kinds of, um, you know, inbound marketing campaigns. And that's, that's kind of the holy grail. Like, as a marketer, if you're not technical, if you don't have a good, you know, like, like, real feel yet for what's going to be effective, you need to know um, which of these things that I'm spending my time and money on are actually resulting in revenue. Um, so you, you obviously have some disadvantages. The primary one being, of course, that you're not sending them all of the data that Drupal Commerce happens to know uh, about the user. Like, like, there is no way to react to like an add to cart form submission to log that as like a significant event in the user journey on your site. Um, you also like you either like can't get or you just can't like easily work with the raw data. I feel like you can like you have certain export capabilities, but off the top of my head, I can't remember exactly what it is. Um, but you know, you, you can't. Um, you know, really work with their raw data to try to like remix that into your own visualizations or your own strategies. You also, um, you, you couldn't do it to do something like predictive, for example, to integrate how people have historically interacted with my sites to then try to predict their next move and market better to them or sell better to them or, or whatever. Um, also, you know, the big challenge is that visitors can block it. <laughs> um, so that, you know, even, even if you just turn on the, uh, the statistics module within Drupal and watch your page view count versus what Google says. Like those are very different numbers. It happens anytime you know you publish to Drupal Planet. You can see literally like how many people are coming from Drupal Planet that obviously have Google blocked and then don't let you um, just count them as a page view. So fair enough. Like um, there is no guarantee that all of your conversions are going to be reported. There is no guarantee that you're going to capture um, all of the data that you think you're going to be capturing. Um, and like, if you've really tried to customize like Google Analytics, it's really kind of hard. Uh, I don't know, do we have any Google Analytics gurus in here? Because I might need to like buy your lunch and have you help me fix mine. Because <laughs> um, I think uh, like DrupalCommerce.org still shows like a dollar value around just anybody who visits like the discussion board or something. I have no clue how that happened. Um, so. Yeah, the advantage, of course, is that even though it's complicated to use, there are many people out there that do know how to use it, so you can find help in the marketplace if you need it. Um, but again, the last uh, you know, primary drawback, of course, is that you know, you're, just, you're not in control of your data. You have no clue what Google's doing with it. And um, who knows what's going to happen next year. So um, that uh, you know, is kind of like the overview for Google Analytics. So, like, the module really is plug and play. You just put it in, you put in, and it's working in conjunction with the, the standalone Google Analytics module for Drupal. Um, so its primary goal is to ensure that the checkout completion page embeds the, you know, the extra elements that you need um, to report the completion of a transaction. Um, but Google Analytics does also offer an API for asynchronous you know, transmission of details, if need be. Um, and so then that brings us to uh, kind of like what we're seeing is like our like ideal future that kind of weds the two. So we're we're still investing obviously in commerce reports. Um, we're seeking maintenance of commerce Google Analytics to try to um, develop that module further. Um, but at the same time, we're also um, considering that that perhaps there's a um, you know a third a, a third way that we can both deliver cheaper, better analytics to our end users and also begin to create a more sustainable business model for Drupal Commerce. And because I, like, I didn't share this this morning in the, in the keynote, but a big part of what lets us continue to do Drupal Commerce and give back is that we've, we've begun to shift our revenue towards sustainable annuities, like annual or residual income lines or streams that let us know we have a baseline. You know, we have a, a baseline of 25% of our revenue right now um, that we're more or less guaranteed to get with some, some maintenance, obviously no, nothing's free. But if we can maintain um, you know, the modules that that comes from, if we can maintain the business relationships that, that, that drive those, and if we can seek out new technology partners like MailChimp, who's joining us as a technology partner this year, um, or Avalara, who does sales tax and VAT compliance, like if we can in incorporate them into what is Drupal Commerce, that then increases our ability to take people off project and continue to focus on developing Drupal Commerce. Um, so Lean Commerce reports, is what we're developing is essentially a plug and play sales dashboard for Drupal Commerce sites. And, and the idea, of course, is to basically price it cheap as free so that you know, it's a no brainer for any Drupal Commerce user. Um, but the idea is that it's, it's a complete sales dashboard that really weds 
the two types of information. Um, so on the one hand, um, you know, we're transmitting denormalized, um, the same denormalized transaction data that we would store in commerce reports, we're transmitting it to an analytics engine called Keen.io. That becomes our, our back end for storing um, transaction data, but then also click path data similarly to Google Analytics. So they, they basically give you the ability to create your own kind of analytics tool. And another open source variant to that was, was Pewik or Matomo, which you know, is, I think maybe still used over here. Um, and so the idea here is that um, if we can pair this information together, one, we can deliver just an out of the box sales dashboard, right? One that has, you know, I'll blow it up a little bit. You know, one that has the ability to tell you your, your 24 hour revenue, your seven day revenue, your projections, or what you did this period versus the last period, um, what your conversion rate is and how it's moving period over period. Because that kind of like prior period comparison is obviously important. Um, but, you know, it's, it's difficult, if not impossible, to, to get this like, kind of performance out of views. Um, to, to build complex queries if you're just hitting your, your structured normalized data. So with Lean Commerce Reports, we're putting these into buckets that we can more easily query and create visualizations from. Uh, and then, of course, that we can build um, whole reports from. So, you know, it also offers out of the box, uh, you know, top product reports, um, top channel reports. And again, this is the kind of data that we can't really get um, within uh, Drupal itself because none of us, well, not none, but not many of us are running um, storage engines that can really ha like be hammered by client-side analytics pushes from some kind of like little JavaScript embedded in the site. So um, Keen.io does, and so we're able to get all of our click path data and then correlate that to transaction data to create conversion funnels that are you know, visualized and filterable by channel and all that kind of stuff. Um, and so again, the idea here is to just create um, out-of-the-box reporting tools that don't require configuration or code, that perfectly understand the full Drupal Commerce transaction lifecycle, but also can be paired up with click path and visitor um, behavior um, analytics to begin to like deliver more insights. And I think man, there's like one more screenshot here. Um, so we have like a full cart and checkout funnel analysis that you know we can do, like I said, what, what Google Analytics can't do, where there's a push to Keen anytime somebody clicks an add cart button. And you could even um, extend it to support like sub-page behaviors. Um, so for example, one of the first products that we kind of thought about creating at Commerce Guys way back in 2010 um, at DrupalCon San Francisco was checkout monitoring. We even like registered checkoutmonitoring.com. I still think it was a great idea. I wish we were doing it today. Um, but the, 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 the main like, idea was that if we could just like analyze the checkout form and guarantee uptime, and then also like just push a notification out to your phone if like suddenly nobody's coupon code is applying. Like you then have this immediate like, oh my checkout form broke, I need to go fix it now, or I need to go just, you know, authenticate any coupon code that comes in while I fix this. Um, and so with um, you know with Lean Commerce reports being embedded into Drupal Commerce itself and kind of natively reacting to commerce events, you can get subpage analytics that could do the same thing. Like um, not just did they add it to the cart and did they proceed to the cart form. But once they got to the checkout form, did they try to enter a coupon code? Maybe that's like a sub-step between uh, checkout and complete. And you can begin to see like how much of my traffic drops off, off if they tried to enter a coupon code and it didn't validate for whatever reason. And that, that's like where, like where we're trying to get to with our granularity by being like native to commerce, um, while also pairing that kind of information with different channels. Um, because the, the reality is, you know, your organic traffic is going to behave differently than your PPC traffic. It's going to behave differently than your Twitter and Facebook promoted post traffic. And, you know, ideally this tool um, will begin to, uh, this is kind of a different topic, but will begin to allow us to, to help Drupal Commerce in users glean that kind of insight without you having to build it every single time. So that's the other drawback as a developer or an agency um, is that with commerce reports, if, if your customer wanted anything custom, you had to build it. You had to write a custom views build. You had to write a custom views filter, arguments, etc. And um, it's, that's just hard. Like I actually, um, I tried recently to write a views, a Drupal 8 views field, I failed. I was like, man, what, what have I lost between Drupal 7 and Drupal 8 that I don't even know where views is defining this stuff anymore. Um, and so like what, what we want is like, to say, okay, reporting, and, and here's kind of like why Commerce Guys focused here first, is that like, it's a pretty standard feature set. Um, if you go into the back end of Shopify, BigCommerce, WooCommerce, Magento, Amazon, like all of their dashboards are gonna show basically the same information. Um, but 
if it's all kind of wrapped up in a module, you, you, the onus is on you to now keep the module up to date and ensure nobody breaks it or customizes it and then it becomes unupdatable or upgradable. Because of course, as soon as you edit a default view, you're no longer going to see changes to that view when you upgrade the module. Um, and so we're, we're trying to just like solve a lot of these problems for agencies and developers so that you can just kind of plug it in, forget about it, and ideally not uh, be a significant cost to the, the merchant. Um, but then to go even further than we've gone before. Um, so, so for example, the, the very first Lean Commerce Reports customer is actually 80 customers. And um, it's a, a retail chain in the United States that, um, well, they, they sell food. I won't name them because then they're not like part of, I don't have that contract with them yet. But, or the, the I can share your name contract. Um, I, I only found out just recently that you're actually supposed to include that in all of your contracts. Like the ability to use them as a profile customer. So free business tip. Get them to let you agree in advance to use their name <laughs> to promote your business. Otherwise, you're either just putting a logo up and hoping they don't notice, or you're not able to name them, um, name them and claim them. Um, but they wanted revenue broken down by store. So they have 80 franchisees. They use in Drupal Commerce 2.x. If you're not familiar, we have a store entity now, so you can have multi-store and marketplace um, style sites built using Commerce natively. Um, theirs is a multi-store model and they needed to break down that revenue by store. So we support that out of the box with um, Lean Commerce Reports. And the next step will be for us to support multi-currency reporting, which is a challenge because you're having to deal with currency conversions and how do you do aggregate statistics if you take payments in both pounds and euros and dollars or whatever else you're, you're doing. Um, so ideally, like, it will continue to grow um, in capabilities and grow alongside of Drupal Commerce and by delivering it as software as a service into the back end of Drupal Commerce, we can basically make sure that it stays up to date. Um, so even with this, this first customer, um, we had an issue where we improved uh, the, the application itself. So the actual reports became uh, better, um, but their client module was not updated at the same time. Um, and so we had to kind of wait on the deployment until they deployed the new client module. And now we're waiting until that collects enough data for them to have meaningful reports before we then upgrade the server again. So like, we're basically doing some of the hard work of trying to keep things in sync so that as Drupal Commerce gets better, as their site improves and grows, um, we can just kind of deliver these automatic improvements to their dashboard without um, the agency who built the site, which is actually um, uh, Chris Teitzel's company, who's the keynote tomorrow, they don't have to maintain it. And, and it was an easy pitch for them. You know. So uh, I think everybody kind of understands the benefits there. Uh, obviously, there are still some similar drawbacks. Um, you, know, you still have to think about GDPR. Okay, so how do we get this data out of um, this analytics engine once we know for certain that it needs to be deleted? So that's still a, a pending question we're working to resolve. <coughs> you also have the issue in that once you start to use uh, an, an unstructured database engine, a, a NoSQL database engine, I have no way to delete records from that, um, that data store. So if, if you did have the kind of model where you wanted to delete a record from your analytics system when uh, an order was deleted within the site, that won't be possible through Lean Commerce Reports, just like it wouldn't be possible through Google Analytics. Um, so there's still some drawbacks, but as a sales tool, primarily a sales and marketing tool, not necessarily as a reporting tool, we expect it to do better. But then if you're actually trying to build like hardcore business reports, like that's where the Commerce Reports module comes into play. Um, and, and one example there is that um, uh, the, the, the primary uh, sponsor of that work um, creates a solution using Drupal Commerce for hospitality companies. Um, so they're, they're bed and breakfast owners, they're small hotel owners. And for them, a reservation comes in uh, as um, the room somebody's renting, the start date, and the end date, right? But if you're trying to do reporting on how many rooms you have available or what your vacancy is on any given day, you have to break that out. So it's not just that they booked a room from here to here, it's that they booked that room on this date, on this date, on this date. So like, that kind of business reporting is where you then use commerce reports because you can create your custom um, tables, you can denormalize that data however you need to, um, and then you know, create these exportable reports using views that match exactly what the business requirements are for the user. Um, I, I suppose that, that distinction is clear, right? Like what's just kind of like sales and marketing versus like actual business reporting. And, yeah. um, so are there any, um, any questions there, like from uh, anything related to reporting, link commerce reports, status of, yes? Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, so uh, for the recording, the question that was asked was, um, what, what sort of reporting do we have in place now or planning to have in place with respect to stock management? And um, we actually are still working on the stock module. Um, so Guy would appreciate your assistance if you uh, <laughs> want to contribute to that. Um, so because that module still has not been fully ported to Drupal 8, it's not integrated yet. Um, but I would anticipate it being integrated. Um, I, I would also say that um, you know, for, for the merchants that we work with, they, they tend to have an ERP and we're just mirroring stock levels within Drupal Commerce. And so like, at least at, at the enterprise level, m more realistically, you're going to be just making sure that the, the data is synchronized between the ERP and the fulfillment management system and the website. Um, so I know our, our most recent client, um, we did like a full two-way synchronization and they actually do predictive uh, purchasing based on their ERP's data, not, not the sites. Yes? Yeah, the, the question is which ERPs are we using to synchronize with Drupal Commerce? And it's, it's actually all bespoke. Every enterprise basically has already made that decision. And as the Drupal, as the e-commerce consultant or developer, like we really just map to what they have in place. Um, so it's similar to like, I can't really drive somebody's payment gateway decision because they've probably been doing payment online for 10 years. I can just give them a fresh, you know, customer experience or, or a new website. Um, but we have done integrations with like BizTrack is one. Um, obviously, we've done QuickBooks integrations in the past, and there's like an alpha status QuickBooks module. Um, but those aren't, those aren't like s serious ERPs. Um, I, I've only heard in passing of like SAP integrations, Oracle integrations, Salesforce integrations. So it's um, almost always bespoke. Any, any other questions on the topic of reporting? If not, I can also open it up to just general commerce um, Q&A as well. Um, or we can go and be the first to lunch because <laughs> the content went faster than I anticipated. <laughs> yes, yeah. Um, I'm fairly new with Commerce module and we were working on Drupal 7. Our question was, is there any accounting module already integrated in Commerce or will there be or will you... The, define accounting module. Like any, anything that could um, have, make journal entries based on your shopping. Okay. Yeah, so the, do you have an answer to that question? Well, we started, we made one for Drupal Commerce 1, and we're reporting it to Drupal 2. Okay, what's the name of the model? It was double into uh, Commerce Dynasty for Keeping, I think. Okay. And that was one of the things we were speaking to Bojan about a while back. Okay. Of reporting to 8, because we felt we needed to do a lot of double entry for keeping. You have to keep the transactions constantly tracked and everything and stuff. Right. That's something we're moving reporting to Drupal 8 and from May. Okay. Yeah, so the answer is probably to go talk to Jamie afterwards, um, because uh, like in the, in the core there's nothing, yeah. and again for our projects, um, integration with accounting software like is always bespoke, you know, just whatever they're using, we just write to it. Um, yeah, and one important thing to remember too is to, to make sure your systems are redundant when you're doing these integrations, so like batch everything in a queue, <laughs> and then process, you can process the queue immediately, but if you're going to be writing any kind of external system, you have to plan for it being inaccessible. Um, do you have a comment there? Just to say that for seven days, an integration with an ERP called Pipepel. Right, Pearl? Yeah. Pipepel, yeah. yeah. Did you do that yourself? Or? Okay, yeah, so for Commerce1.x and Drupal 7, Brightpearl is an option. And another QuickBooks is an option as well. I, I don't know how well maintained the QuickBooks integration is for seven right now. So. Alright, any other? Yeah? I'm just wondering if you've done any work with uh, Google Tag Manager. I, I have not. Yeah, I'm, I'm only familiar as a, you know, as I see what what the marketers are doing on our sites and how many tags we have. And I go, oh my goodness, <laughs> thirty JavaScript uh, files to to collect user interaction data. Um, but if it is, it is in, we also have Google Tag Manager experience integrating or analyzing that data. We've done quite. We've done some tagging of JavaScript events. It's quite useful for understanding. <coughs> Yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, any, any, yeah. yeah. In terms of database performance, do you have any plans on that? To improve the database performance? Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I, can, yeah, I can share some tips right now. So the question is, in terms of database performance, how do we ensure that Drupal Commerce actually can perform? Um, and we actually had a, a handful of clients come through in the last two years even 
as Drupal Commerce sites mature and they grow in capabilities and scale, everybody kind of hits this, this uh, ceiling, no matter how much hardware they throw at it, where they start to get um, lock wait timeout errors or database deadlocks, where um, two different requests are trying to access the same database table and it locks up, you know, and then you drop requests, which is a, a royal pain if your request that gets dropped was a checkout completion event and somebody goes away and you lose money. Um, and so to, to optimize the database, there, there are several things that we've done within Commerce 1.x and things that we just won't even have to worry about in 2.x. Um, first of all is that whenever you um, configure your MySQL database, you can change what's called your transaction isolation level or isolation mode. Um, so if you Google, Google that, like Drupal transaction isolation level, like you're going from like read, 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 read committed or something. I can't remember exactly the, the toggle that we make for people, but it, but it literally like like four x's the the number of uh, concurrent transactions we've been able to support just by toggling that one variable. Because instead of locking an entire table or an entire like section of rows in a table whenever you load an order, it's just going to lock like a, a smaller block or that particular you know resource that's been loaded. So. That's one thing, just like some simple database optimizations like that. Obviously, you can look into your, your slow queries and add keys or indexes or whatnot. Um, but then also, um, we stopped using Entity Metadata wrappers in Drupal 7. <laughs> Anywhere that we can, avoiding that module in particular, the Entity API's metadata wrapper system um, has been a big performance boon and just general stability boon. Um, the first step for us was in wrapping anywhere that we use Entity Metadata wrappers in a try-catch to prevent all the fatal errors, and then now to just like get rid of it completely to avoid some um, kind of gnarly like uh, garbage collection issues that we were experiencing. Um, we did have a garbage collection issue recently where um, I, I don't remember where we documented it, um, but uh, but becoming more aggressive about garbage collection also fixed some performance issues within PHP, uh, and then um, you know finally too just within Commerce 2.x like. Um, uh, yeah, just just uh, being smarter about the way that we've designed Drupal Commerce. Um, so, for example, in Commerce 1.x, pricing happens by default every time a page is loaded. This is until I, I fixed it in like Commerce 1.9 or 1.13 or something. But, but the, the idea is that whenever we first built Drupal Commerce, I thought, well, I always want to make sure that this shopping cart has the most up-to-date accurate pricing ever. And so, in my naivety, it was just like, oh, well, then any time an order is loaded, I'm going to revalidate the prices on every single item on this order, <clears throat> which obviously incurs a lot of overhead on every page request then. And it still happens every time a shopping cart page or checkout page is loaded within Commerce 1.x. Um, but it's just stupid. Like, you don't need to revalidate pricing that frequently for the vast majority of use cases. But we kind of, like, over-engineered, if you will. It, it didn't take a whole lot of extra code, but it was, it was like, um, uh, working for like the minuscule use case versus just privileging like the performance for the, the average user. Um, we did that in a couple of areas, like even forcing everyone to use rules for pricing in 1.x was that, that same kind of misguided approach to, to setting priorities. Um, so we've reduced like how frequently price calculation happens in 2.x. We've also made it more explicit. It's all driven by code now um, and improved our cacheability so that it, like a lot more in Drupal 8 is cacheable uh, and we're also working to uh, make a lot more of Drupal Commerce like client um, client citable. I don't know what the word would be for that, but you know, basically, um, instead of uh, you know returning a page that, that loads and renders via views a shopping cart block, doing that client side via just JavaScript fetching the cart data and um, rendering that asynchronously into the JavaScript page. Like that, that's an essential um, optimization for Commerce 1.x because that, that of course lets you hit your Cache pages more frequently, decreasing your database load, yada yada. So, um, those are the, like, we, we have a lot of bumps and bruises, a lot of things that we've learned that are informing what we're doing for 2.x. And even right now, I think we just finished up for a new demo for Drupal Commerce and the Belgrade theme that we've been developing, um, just a set of like custom JSON routes to handle cart manipulation so that we can have just a client side rendered cart block that you can manipulate quantities and remove items without having to submit Drupal forms or load and render that stuff in any average page load. So then, of course, you can cache and deliver from the cache the rest of the entire page except for the cart block. Um, yeah. There's probably more that I'm missing, I'm sure. Uh, but uh, good questions for Boyan for us to, to raise. Any, any other questions about 2.x or performance reporting features? Just to say yeah, that um, stock used to be incredibly heavy um, for um, 
excitement, and now it's just kicking us. Great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and part of that, too, is like we set the pattern early on that rules should be used where we wanted merchants to be able to configure things. And so stock is an example where everything was built around default rules configurations. And we just we didn't really think about the potential overhead. But that was it was actually yeah. updating products. So if people checked out and they had like, um, you know, like people that sell wholesale and people who were buying sort of hundreds of line items, you need to go and update hundreds of products. So right. an entity updates are really heavy. And the people, so now there's a, a transactional system, so it's a single insert, mm -hmm. super efficient. Great. Yeah, we, we even did that on a one.x client site where we just created, basically just bypassed the stock model entirely and essentially created a cache table that was specifically for stock holds. Because that's all they really needed was the ability to track holds on inventory so they didn't oversell the product. But then all the actual inventory management happened in the ERP and we just had to keep it synced. But, um, I think I saw one more question. I can get the last one. Or maybe I didn't. All right. I imagine that. Let's go ahead and wrap up then and we'll be the first ones to lunch. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Yeah, we, yeah, we, we, would, we would essentially say that like, the Drupal Commerce database would be your reporting database, and then the sales and analytics side would come from Lean Commerce reports. So basically, just you know, export the, the denormalized uh, you know, records that you, that you don't necessarily depend on being 100% accurate 100% of the time. They're really more for, for high level decision making. Yeah. Um, so I think, I think it could go either way. I think. The advantage of like a third-party tool like Google Analytics or our, our own product is that uh, yeah, you, you get these client-side reporters that already know how to do all that data collection, and then you just kind of have to know how to configure it and build your yeah. But hey, thank you. Ryan. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for thanks cheers. for coming. Yeah, cheers. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, Fran? Uh, yeah, Fran. Uh, Fran. <laughs> Fran. It's from with Alec. From, okay. <laughs> okay. Where are you from? Uh, Spanish, San uh, Francisco. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, but I live here in the UK. What's uh, so what's the the diminutive form? Would that be Pablo? Uh, or, uh, what's what's the, the 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 diminutive like name for nickname for Francisco? Uh, it's from yeah. It's just just from what? Yeah. Pancho. Pancho. Oh well, Pancho Paco as well. Paco. Yeah. There's an Ernest Hemingway short story that starts with a character named Francisco and he's called Paco. Anyways, yeah, yeah, sorry, yeah, 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 I mean, uh, it was just a question I should have asked you before. Are there any plans to do an API first uh, sort of initiative? Because oh, you yeah. mentioned the client side. Oh, actually, we just uh, we just blogged about it this week. Uh -huh. So the, our latest post in the Commerce Guys blog was like, what does it look like for Drupal Commons to be API first? Mm -hmm. And really, for us, that that means improving, uh, kind of improving JSON API, mm -hmm. and maybe even creating our own extension to JSON API, which is not technically supported right now, but, mm -hmm. you know, we have um, uh, a need within e-commerce to be able to define the ways that, uh, an a that an API consumer should interact with the API, right? Um, so if, if you're, if from an API you want to load a product and then render that product in your client's app, you might need to know, is this user allowed to add it to the cart? 
-hmm. And if there are, do they need to specify anything else, like their name or whatever, like if it's a registration form or something? Yeah. And there are other hypermedia content types, you know, besides JSON API that have uh, schemas for creating these kind of like forms, like mm -hmm. API forms or link templates, you know, for building your, your query parameters. Mm -hmm. And I want to do the same thing for commerce for JSON API usage because otherwise you end up basically creating like an RPC framework where you like you just have a bunch of function calls like you valid can this user add this to the cart? Okay, then you know, and, and that's not yeah, really yeah, restful. That's not really mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't give you like the full realization, I suppose, of, of what you know API first could be, especially if it's pursuing REST and hypermedia like principles. Um, but I understand that I'm, I'm a bit of an idealist when it comes to REST. Yeah, I mean, it's all right. You know, it's, uh, uh, I mean, my, my question was mainly whether this was at least in, in your mind. So yeah, yes, it's yeah. That is in there. In, in that fact, it's, it's already in progress. Um, I think it's um, we have a commerce cart flyout module. That includes these custom JSON routes that I mentioned, where it's a bit more of like a back end for front end approach. It's just like custom JSON routes that let you manipulate the car contents in like a flyout menu, like our Belgrade theme does. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, it's uh, Matt Glomman, um, the, the maintainer for Commerce Reports and co maintainer of Commerce 2, uh, he just blogged like the first post about it on our Commerce channel. Oh, well, that's pretty cool. I yeah. check it out then. Yeah, great. Yeah. Yeah. And if, I mean, if you want to get involved too, I mean, I know Win Lears. Is, is heavily involved in that from a core Drupal standpoint. Matt from my team is mm -hmm. pursuing that from a commerce standpoint, and you know, we definitely love that mm -hmm. type of support. Cool. Yeah. Thank you. Great, yeah. Mm -hmm. Nice to meet you. Yeah. Hello. Hey. What is it? Andrew. Yeah, just Andrew. 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 One of the things that I find difficult to find is developers that can do small work. Okay, okay, yeah, because I think you can, I think it's beautiful to say. Okay. Like finding just like small, yeah, we'll small yeah. 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 yeah, at what price point? Yeah. That's the question. Yeah. It's like, yeah. are you trying to find yeah. options yeah. to do it for thirty dollars an hour or one hundred fifty dollars an hour? Like, right. Your, right. Uh, well, uh, I think that's that's not an issue. Uh, okay. Uh, yeah, because the too too low price, the time is probably too long. No. So it's yeah, yeah, true. And, uh, so basically, the way that I do it for my companies, I just have a lot of people that I've worked with for years that I okay. can depend on, you know, like being a part of the Drupal.